Well, good morning, Frontline. My name is Trent, and I serve as the worship pastor down at New Life Church in Wayland. And I'm so excited to be able to worship with all of you today. We're just doing a fun little worship leader swap where all of us worship pastors on staff in the Zero Collective, we just went to a different church this week. But as we enter into this time of worship through singing this morning, I just wanna encourage you to not just sing these words, but to make this, these songs that we're singing, make these our declarations. So we're gonna be singing about who God is and what he's done. And in that, we're gonna make it our prayer that he would reveal to us what he's doing right now, that we'd be made aware of that. So as we get ready to enter into this time of singing, would you join me in a word of prayer? Would you stand as we pray together? Let's pray. God, we thank you for who you are, for what you've done. God, we thank you that we can see just the evidence of your goodness in every area of our lives. God, we can look back and see the ways that you've worked. God, that we can see the way you're working right now. We just ask as we begin to praise you this morning, God, that our hearts will be softened, that you would reveal to us what it is you're doing in this place so that we can be a part of it. But God, we love you and we thank you. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. So come on, let's get ready to make this our declaration this morning. We've seen what you can do. Oh 
God of revival pour. Come on, sing it out. Pour it out. Come awaken your people. Come awaken this city. Oh, God of revival, pour it out. Pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. I hear the chains hit the
this out. Prodigals come home. Prodigals come home. The helpless find hope. And love is on the move when the father's in the room. Prison doors fling wide. The dead come to life. And love is on the move. Shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Amen. Do we give him a praise offering? Yes. This is our Father's house, and the Spirit moves here, and He is here. Let's ask Him to wash over us as the Spirit. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. So calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room,
rest on us this morning. Come and fill us. Lord, allow our hearts to worship you and only you this morning. Lord, allow us to fill with your joy and nothing else. Lord, we are blessed to be able to worship you this morning and only you. Come and fill this place. In Jesus' name, we all said, amen. Go ahead and be seated. My name is Amanda and I'm the children's pastor here at Frontline and it is so awesome to be able to worship with you all today in person and online, so welcome. I have the honor to be able to be up here today to let you know of a few things happening in the life of our church. First, if you've been tracking with us, you know here at Frontline that prayer is the, f- the foundation to everything that we do and pr- everything we do flows out of prayer. So this Wednesday will be our third Uh, prayer gathering of the summer. And our prayer gatherings is a time where we can come together as a church community, come before him and pray over a specific focus or items for the evening. But we don't just do that. We also take some time to pray over one another as well. So we would love our church community to come join us this Wednesday for our next prayer gathering here at Frontline. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but fall is almost here. And one sure sign of that is our kiddos, most of them will be headed back to school this coming week, which for parents, I know that's just exciting now to have some rhythm and some uh, routines back in your homes. And with fall brings those, some, those, those routines and those new rhythms. And one, one, one thing we need to do right now is we need to time to come and reconnect and replug within our church community. We've been gone and traveling for the summer, but now it is time to come back and to get plugged into community. So on September 11th, we're having our annual Welcome Home Sunday. We'll have some fun things during the service for you to enjoy, but also after each service, we'll have a community picnic out in our parking lot. So join us for that. Also, um, as I said earlier, I'm the children's pastor for our children's ministry over, uh, over, this, over this way. Um, and this summer, we have seen growth unlike any summer before. Um, lots of babies being born, lots of new families coming to make Frontline their home. And so we have this new and exciting buzz that's happening in our children's ministry. And with fall coming and regular routines, we're gonna see numbers that we haven't seen in a couple years because of COVID and whatnot. Um, So we need you. We need six adults who wanna come alongside our elementary age kiddos and point them to Jesus. I could stand up here and tell you the impact you could have on their faith and the lifelong impact you could have for them, but I thought we'd better if they took a moment to tell you some of the things that they appreciate and love about the volunteers who've served them each week. So you watch this video with me. That he treats people the way he wants to be treated. Uh, they teach me how to pray. Um, that she's always really nice and caring and teaches you everything you really need to know about the good word of God. And that we get to do from crafts. What I like about Mr. Ron is that he teaches us. Thank you that they um, play with me and learn with me. I wish I could come here every day and I love playing with my teachers and they're so great and I love them. Thank you for teaching me about God. They're really nice and they can help me out whenever I need help. Um, and then they also teach me really good things about God. That they always like to play, that we are always able to play games and learn about God. Uh, that they're so kind and they teach us a lot of cool stuff. She, she makes us laugh a lot and she does fun things with us to make it fun. Uh, she's nice and she's kind. She helps us when we need help. I like when she, um, teaches us about the story, um, when um, Jesus died on the cross. <laughs> yeah. They are amazing. They are my heart. These kids are so amazing. And just the way that they are learning and and showing their relationship in a public way has just been really cool to see. 
So I hope you heard their heart um, and how much they really love and admire the people who stand up and say, yes, I will serve these kiddos in this way. So just a reminder, we are looking for six adults who want to just love on and point these kids to Jesus. You will be making a kingdom impact that's gonna last for generations to come. So if you'd like to come help us, you can see on the screens online and in person on how to do that. Or you can just come find me after service. I would love to talk to you more about that. As we transition into a time of giving, I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for the ways that you faithfully give here at Frontline. Because of the ways that you faithfully give, we're able to impact our kids both here at Frontline and in our community in great ways. This past July, we welcomed 128 kiddos in this facility for Spring Hill Day Camp. And of those 128 kids, 38 of them either accepted Christ for the first time or made a deeper commitment in their relationship with God that week. Yes, praise Jesus, praise Jesus. This, this past weekend, we were able to celebrate five children getting baptized and saying yes to Jesus. And this next weekend, we get to come alongside eight families who are ready to make the public commitment to raise their children to know and love Jesus through our child dedication. Because of the ways that you guys give here financially, you are opening the door and setting the stage for all of that to happen. So thank you. Thank you for making an in-kingdom impact that only impacts our kids now, but ripples into their life as adults and their life as a parent in generations to come. So thank you. Just a reminder, there are several ways to give, and you can see those on the screens, both in, in person behind me and online this morning. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for entrusting us with these little beauties. Thank you for their hearts. And Lord, I just pray that we can point them to you every day and that they have a faith that lasts a lifetime. And thank you just for these people and name the ways that they give so that we can do that. Lord, this morning as Brian, Pastor Brian gets over, up this morning to deliver the message, I just ask that our hearts are open to just hear what you wanna tell us this morning, that it takes root into our hearts and that as we walk out this morning, that we're walking out closer with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to see you if you're here in the room. If you're watching with us online, it's great to have you with us as well. And uh, we've got a lot to celebrate right now. Are you, are you picking up on that? Even just some of the stuff that Amanda just shared. And um, today we are wrapping up um, our last sermon in this sermon series we've been working through uh, talking about soul care. How do we care for the most important part of us? We've been looking at these 12 spiritual disciplines, 12 ways that we can deepen our relationship with Jesus and care for our souls. And so we're wrapping that up today talking about worship. Um, and our, our, our team, didn't they do an incredible job just a moment ago leading us in worship? Um, and something I'm just uh, really excited about with that, I don't know if you noticed, uh, you're, you're here at the beginning, you may have heard him say it, but uh, that was Trent who was leading us in worship. Trent is actually the worship pastor of New Life Church in uh, Wayland. And so part of our, one of our sister churches in the Zero Collective. And so all the worship leaders this morning at all four churches are kind of playing like uh, musical chairs, literally. <laughs> they're, they're moving around. So Carol Ann and Corey are both at Center Church in Byron Center this morning. I can't remember where everybody is. But uh, basically that's part of, as Corey is mentoring and kind of helping our entire team grow across the entire network, um, this was an opportunity for everybody to kind of see what it was like in each other's environments. And that was awesome. Um, and then, by the way, I just noticed this while Trent was up here. He has pink tennis shoes. Uh, there's this whole like leadership proverb, but you always need somebody in the room with pink tennis shoes. That's what, you know, it's like somebody with, he's just creative. And I just realized, man, the guy has pink tennis shoes, literally. Uh, so anyway, that was just awesome. But it's great to, to be here and celebrating. Three weeks from now, we're wrapping up this series today, but three weeks from now, fall 
fall is going to be back in, and man, I'm excited for fall. It's going to be sweater weather. Everything's going to be pumpkin spiced up, and um, man, football games are going to be back. It's going to be awesome. And on that day, on Welcome Home Sunday, we're going to be launching into a, a brand new series that's going to take us into our fall. I'm really excited about it. I uh, hope you'll, you'll come and be a part of that. In the next couple of weeks, you're going to hear a little bit more about what that series is all about. Uh, but today, we're talking about worship. And wrapping up this uh, series, talking about the spiritual discipline of worship. And so I'll begin this way. How would you feel if you squandered something of incredible worth and you didn't realize it until it was too late? How would you feel if you squandered something of incredible worth, but you didn't realize it until the moment had passed, until it was too late? Um, go ahead, if you could, this first picture. This is a Chinese bowl that a guy sold at a garage sale for $3. As you look at that, I don't know what you'd pay uh, for that, but literally this guy had had it in his family for years and years on the East Coast, and it was in the attic. He literally sold it to another guy for $3 uh, at his uh, garage sale. Later on, this same exact Chinese bowl sold to Sotheby's for $2.2 million. You can go look it up. Uh, this was a, it turns out this was a treasure from the Northern Song Dynasty. It's this ancient relic this, uh, from an ancient Chinese dynasty. Can you imagine being the guy who sold it for $3 at the garage sale and then realized later, like, wait, are you kidding me? That's what that was worth? On a more personal note, go ahead if you could to that next picture. This is my dad's Martin 1959 Model 018 acoustic guitar. Um, this guitar is actually the guitar I learned how to play guitar on. As a teenager, you can see it's kind of beat up and everything. That's from me. And this guitar is actually in my possession now. My dad gave it to me. The way my, it came to be in my dad's possession is um, back when my dad was in college at Butler University in Indianapolis, there was another guy in the dorm room who had gotten his girlfriend pregnant. And so he was trying to sell off a bunch of his stuff, you know, to like provide and everything. And so he had this guitar. And my dad didn't play guitar. He didn't know how to play guitar, but he just said, hey, I'll give you 50 bucks for that guitar. And the guy said, sure. So he gave my dad the guitar for 50 bucks. And it's been in our family ever since. A few years ago, my dad kind of realized like, hey, the name Martin, it carries some value for acoustic guitars. And so this is several years ago now, we went and we had this guitar assessed. And because it's still got all the original hardware, the original neck, the original bridge, I didn't beat it up too bad, thankfully. Uh, it was assessed somewhere between six and seven thousand dollars, and its value is just going up. Again, it's probably closer to ten today. Can you imagine? I'll give you fifty bucks for that guitar. Sure, sounds good. I didn't even realize <laughs> what this thing would be worth. The reason I tell you that is because that's what we do with worship a lot of times. That, that's what we do. So if I could give you kind of a working definition of worship as we talk about it this morning, worship is the act of ascribing ultimate value to someone or something. What we just did a few moments ago, whenever we gather together like this as a community and we worship together, that's what we're doing. We are ascribing ultimate value or worth to someone, the person of Christ. Uh, in fact, our English word worship comes from the old English worthship. So, so that's exactly what we're doing. We're, we're ascribing worthship to someone or something. That, that's what it means to worship. Now, a lot of people have God in their lives. They have him in the same way that that guy had that Chinese bull at his garage sale. Or, or the guy in the dorm had, had the guitar for 50 bucks. We believe in him. He's there, he, you know, he's in the background of our lives. He's on the shelf somewhere. We believe in him, but he, we're not holding him up as the highest value, the, the number one place in our lives where we are ascribing the highest worth and value to him. That's, that's where many of us are. And in fact, it really wasn't that different in Jesus' day. Jesus in Matthew chapter 15 uh, basically makes an indictment to the people of his day. They were at the temple worshiping and he, he, he uses the words of the prophet Isaiah to, to speak about the people of his day and what was wrong with their worship and, and why their worship wasn't connecting. 
And so this passage of scripture originally was said to the people of Isaiah's day in Isaiah 28, and then Jesus used it and said it to the people of his day in the first century. And I, I guess I'm using it today to speak to us in, in our world today about our worship as well. So this is what Jesus says, Matthew 15, verse 8. He says, these people, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. So, so Jesus says the problem with their worship is that their hearts aren't in it. They're checking the box, but, but they don't really understand who I am. I, I think it's interesting. Jesus didn't say, you know, the problem with their worship today, the problem with worship today is that people aren't trying hard enough, you know. They, they need to work harder at singing better or, or you know, the problem today is that we're, we need to do some new songs, or, you know, we need some better lighting. We need some, some better sound system or whatever. That's not what Jesus says. He says that the problem with our worship is they don't really know me, he says. And they don't really understand how much I'm really worth. They don't get how valuable I actually am. They worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Uh, my wife, Carrie, and I, tomorrow uh, is our anniversary. We will have been married 24 years tomorrow which is awesome. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah. 24 years ago, I tricked her into marrying me, and it's been awesome ever since. I love my wife. Uh, let's say like for her birthday this coming November, let's say like for her birthday, imagine I decide I'm going to throw Carrie a huge birthday party. And so what I do is I invite all my friends. I don't invite her friends. I invite my friends. And then, um, you know, for the food, I decide to get Buffalo Wild Wings. I love wings. And uh, she hates Buffalo Wild Wings. She does not like that at all. But I, I cater in all this Buffalo Wild Wings. And then let's say like for the present, um, when it's time to give the present, my wife loves horses, loves everything about horses. Let's say like I give her a motorcycle, <laughs> something I would want. And I'm like, honey, look, I got you a motorcycle. But then when it comes time to you know, bring the cake out and sing the song, I sing. I say, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Carrie. Like I use her name. I put her name in the song. Happy birthday to you. Was that a successful birthday party that honored my wife for her birthday? <laughs> no. Jesus is saying that's exactly what we do with worship. You, they honor me with their lips. They, they, they put my name in the songs. You know, they sing the song to me. But everything else, it's, it, they really, it's, it's about themselves. That's, that's what we tend to do. That's what the people of Isaiah's time did. That's what the people of Jesus' time did. That's what we still do. It's a human tendency for all of us. We, we honor him with our lips, but, but really everything else about worship, really when we come together, it's not really his party. Oftentimes we make it about us. We make it about our preferences, our wants, our desires. Uh, it's just kind of a reflection of, of who we are and what we aren't. So why do we do that? Why do we have such a hard time ascribing ultimate value and worth to God? Why do we make it about us so often? We'll honor him with our lips, but our hearts are far from him. And the reason I would submit to you today is because for every single one of us in this room, you're already worshiping something. You're already worshiping something. You are already ascribing ultimate value and worth to something in your life. Every single one of us is. It's human nature. That there is something in your life and in my life that you already have in this place where you're saying, man, if I could just attain, if I could just get that, then I'd be worth something. Then I'd be secure. Then I, I, I'd be beautiful. Then I would have happiness and contentment or, or whatever it is. So, so really this morning, I don't have to teach you how to worship. You already know how to worship. You're already doing it. There's something in your life you're already ascribing ultimate value and worth to. It just, it, it may not be the person of Christ. So every single one of us, what is it for you? At the heart of every single one of us, we have something we treasure. Um, maybe you're in a season of life where, you know, that thing is a job. Man, if I could just change jobs, if I could just get the right career. Uh, I just read a statistic this past week. Did you know uh, 72 million people changed jobs last year in 2021? Isn't that crazy? I'm gonna, I hate this word uh, over the last two years, but I'm going to use it anyway. That's unprecedented. <laughs> it is. So many people just said, oh, if I could just, if I could just get over here and it would fix everything. 
For other people, uh, maybe as a couple, maybe you've gone through the sting and the pain of infertility. And so at the, tr- the treasure that we begin to ascribe ultimate value to, a baby, if we could just have a baby, if we could just get pregnant, it would fix everything. It would fix everything in the marriage. It would fix everything in my life. And then I would be worth something. Uh, maybe you're in a different season of life. Maybe you're at the stage of life where, you, where you, it's like a number in the bank account. Ah, oh, if we could just get to that number, if we could just have this amount in the bank account, then we could retire. Then we could buy the house. Then we could go live where we want to live. Every single one of us, we have something at the heart of ourselves that we, that we treasure, that we ascribe ultimate value to. And the problem with that is that every treasure in our lives, other than the person of Jesus Christ, demands that we die in order to purchase it. Think about it. Every treasure other than the person of Christ demands that you die in order to get it. The message is, run after me, sacrifice everything to get me, do whatever you have to ta- do, work as hard as you have to work to attain me and to get me, and then you will have security and you will have beauty. But the beauty of the gospel The beauty of the gospel message is that Jesus is the only treasure who actually dies in order to purchase us. He he is the only treasure that when we we put him at the center of our lives, when we make him the highest value of our lives, he actually dies in order to purchase us. Our worth and our value actually doesn't come from something external. It comes from what he calls us to be, what he says we are, and our identity in him. That's where we find ultimate value. That's where we find ultimate purpose and ultimate worth. What's amazing about Jesus' life is that Jesus actually faced the same temptation that we face when it comes to worship. Jesus faced the temptation to put something other than God in that ultimate, other than his heavenly father, in that ultimate place of value and worth in his life. He faced the temptation to worship something else. You find it early in Jesus' life. If you, you know, take Matthew 15, where we were just a moment ago, where Jesus makes that indictment against the people of his day. If you wind the clock back to Matthew chapter 4, Jesus, before he'd ever, you know, performed any miracle, before he'd ever healed anyone or preached any sermons, Jesus in Matthew 4, before he begins his ministry, he goes out into the wilderness and he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights to draw closer to God. And during that period of time, Satan comes to him and offers him three temptations. Some of you remember this. Some of you have read through this. And what's amazing about these three temptations that Jesus undergoes from the devil is that they are kind of the big three. They're the big three that every single human being faces. They're common to all of us. And they're also the big three that Israel faced when they were wandering in the wilderness. And so we're going to look today at the third of those three temptations because believe it or not, the third temptation Jesus faced had to do with worship. It's that big a deal. It's it's the same temptation all of us face. One of the big three has to do with worship. So let's look at this together. This is the third temptation Jesus faces in Matthew 4. It says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain And showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. So he offers Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, all their splendor, power, authority, political, you know, ability and power and kingly, you know, majesty. If you bow down and worship me, I'll give it all to you. Now, I don't know about you, the, I, the first time I ever remember reading this, I remember the thought I had was, really? Is that a temptation for Jesus to worship the devil? I mean, you think about it, like son of God, Messiah, would that really be a temptation for Jesus to worship the devil? I mean, that would not look good on a resume, would it? Son of God, but yeah, I worship the devil. Uh, that's, that's my thing. That, that wouldn't work, Right. So I I used to think, like, that's ridiculous. Why would Jesus even be tempted? But if you look a a layer deeper at this, what you begin to realize is this temptation held out for Jesus everything that he would have treasured, even as the Son of God, even as the Messiah, it had everything that he would have treasured. Think about it. In this moment, Satan is literally saying to Jesus, you know what, Jesus? I'm going to step out of your way. I'm not going to get in your way at all. He said, I, I will give you all the kings, the kingdoms of this earth, the limited dominion and power and authority that I have been given for this period of time. I'm going to lay it all down. I'll step out of the way. I'll let you do whatever you want. You can be in charge. And you know what? You don't even have to go through the cross. You don't even have to suffer and die and all that stuff. You can just have it now. 
And you can direct the world however you want. Think about what Jesus would have valued, what he would have treasured. I mean, you realize this would have been a perfect opportunity for Jesus in charge of all the kingdoms of all the world to make the world exactly the way it was supposed to be. You remember when Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray? Remember he teaches them to pray, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth the way it is in heaven. Do you realize this was a chance for Jesus literally to make his kingdom, uh, you know, on earth come exactly the way that he wanted it to be on, on earth as it is in heaven. This was a chance to, for him to actually do that. In one move, Jesus could have ended all wars. There'd been no more Ukraine and Russia, no more world wars, nothing. He could have ended all suffering. He could have eradicated all injustice, all poverty in the world, and he could have made it exactly how he wanted. There's only one catch. You've got to worship, Satan says, me. You've got to worship me in the highest place. You've got to ascribe ultimate value and ultimate worth to me in order to do that. And what Satan does is he comes along to you and me and he whispers the same thing in your ear and in my ear. He says the same thing to us every single day. Because Satan knows if he can just get you to put something other than God in the highest value of your, of your life, ascribe worship to something other than God, and to value that above all else, to make that something else, the treasure that you're seeking after, he's already won. He's already got you. Because you'll never live out and fulfill God's perfect plan for your life. He, you'll never live into what he's set aside and he's designed for you to do. Ephesians 2.10, that you're God's workmanship designed, prepared in advance to do good works that he's advanced for you to do. Without God at the center of your life as the highest value, you'll never do those things. And Jesus wouldn't have either. Philippians 2 tells us that God already had a plan. It says that Jesus, the plan was for him to come to this earth, for him to not have political and, and kingly power during his time, but to sacrifice his life, to give up his life on the cross and a sacrificial death for our sins and to raise to new life that one day it says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. He will be established as the highest uh, authority over everything in heaven and on earth and where else? Under the earth. Satan was going to have to bow down eventually anyway. But the temptation was, worship me now, you can have it all now. You don't even have to have the cross. You can just have it. Jesus doesn't take the bait. I love this verse 10. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. That's how Jesus responds. Now, what's beautiful about this is Jesus, the way he re rebuffs Satan in this temptation is he quotes scripture. What he's quoting there, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. That is Deuteronomy 6, verse 13. Now, why that's so significant is because Deuteronomy 6 is a chapter of the Bible. It was a central passage for the people of Israel, and it's all about worship. It begins with a holy prayer called the Shema that the Israelites would have said every single day. It begins, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then it speaks uh, what Jesus called the greatest of all the commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And then in verse 13, it says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. That whole uh, chapter in the Bible is all about how to love God as the highest value of your life, how to worship him only. And Jesus quotes that passage to Satan. He says, this is what I'm called to do. The only way I'm going to get where I'm called to do is to go with God's plan, is to put him in the highest place and let him lead me in my life. And that's the only way it works for us too. Now, I know what you're thinking. Right now, what you're thinking is, well, yeah, that's great, but he was Jesus, right? That, that's great that, that Jesus was able to do that, but he's Jesus. I'm me. So, so how do we move into this place in our lives? How do we begin to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength? How do we begin to worship him only as the highest value of our lives? I want to share with you something. This is a... Uh, this was written by a guy named Bernard of Clairvaux. Bernard of Clairvaux was a, was a French abbot in the 12th century. And he wrote about, the, it's, it's called A Treatise on Love, if you're interested in looking it up online or, or you know, going a layer deeper with this. A Treatise on Love, he talked about these four moves that we make as we begin to grow. For all of us kind of start at the same point, and as we begin to grow, and we, and we begin to grow in worship, and we begin to love God, uh, how these four kind of stages we move through until we get to the point where we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and worship him alone. 
And so I'm going to give you the first three of these four because I've just found them to be so meaningful and helpful in my life personally. It's, it's been such a, there's a reason that we're still talking about that all these years later. I'm only going to give you the first three because what Bernard of Clairvaux says is actually the fourth of these steps, the fourth of these kind of stages we move through, we only will accomplish in heaven. So the, the fourth one of these, we're only going to be able to love God and worship God to this degree once we're in heaven. Uh, and by, by the way, do you guys know what we're going to be doing in heaven? Revelation 6 says that we're going to be gathered around the throne of God in heaven with all the saints and all the angels. We're going to be joining in singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We're going to be worshiping. That's what all of eternity is building up for. This is just a practice run for that. That's where it's all headed. And Bernard of Clairvaux says this fourth stage, we're only going to experience that once we get to heaven. So I'm only going to give you the first three of the treatise of love, the first three that he talks about, because I, I'm pretty sure that uh, we're all still alive here in this room. Is that true? Or is everybody still alive uh, online? Uh, I'm guessing that all of you, you're still alive. So we'll just talk about the first three. The fourth one all only happens when we get to heaven. So here's the first one. The base point where everybody starts is I'll love me for me. All of us, this is where we begin. I'll love me for me. We're interested in God, but it's really about me loving me. It's a selfish love. Uh, an illustration of this kind of love, um, the way I've heard it described is, it's kind of like how a consumer loves a brand. Think about it that way. You know, people talk about like, man, I love Starbucks. I mean, I love, you know, pumpkin spice latte here in a few weeks. I love Starbucks. But, you know, what, you understand when someone says that, when they, when they say I love Starbucks, they're not saying I sacrificially love Starbucks. Starbucks is the highest value of my life. That's not what they're saying. They're saying I love me drinking some Starbucks, right? That's what they're really saying. I, lo I love me for me. Starbucks just helps me love me a little bit better. People say, oh, I love Apple. I love Apple products, right? They're not saying I really sacrificially love Apple. They're just saying, I love me using the new iPhone. That's, uh, that's, that's what they're really saying. That's I love me for me. But, it, but what happens is eventually at some point we begin to, to be able to love God and we begin to actually have a love for the other and an awareness of the other. So we eventually move into this place where I'll love God for me. So we, it is actually a love of the other, but it still has a selfish motive. It's not a purely selfish love, but it has a selfish motive. It's I'll love God, I'll worship him, but I'll love him for me. It's I'll worship him with my lips, but my heart is gonna be still far from him. Uh, maybe a, a good way to understand this is if you think about most of the prayers that we pray. For, for most of us, our prayers are, I love God for me. We, we begin with prayer. We just, God, here's my request. God, will you help me with this? Will you help me with that? I've got this problem. I've got that problem. Will you answer this prayer? A lot of times we skip right over worship, don't we? And our prayer life is just, here's, here's what I need you to do for me, God. So I love God, but I love him for me. An illustration of this is if, if you've ever seen uh, uh, an infant with his mother, you think of like a newborn baby with their mother. Infants, you know, they love their mother. They love their mother. And later on in life, certainly they will love their mother as well. But when they're an infant, they don't really love their mother for any other reason that their mother is providing for every single need of their life, right? It's like literally if that mother doesn't provide every need that they have, that child is going to die. So infants love their mother. They have a bond and a connection with their mother, but it's, I'll love my mother for me. And that's where so much of us are. This kind of love, I'll love God for me, hasn't yet understood the gospel, hasn't yet gone through the crucible of grasping the gospel. It's still an attempt to say, okay, I'll love God, but it's so I can get something from him, so I can earn something from him, so he'll answer some prayers. I'll try to be good. I'll try to love him. I'll try to worship him so that he'll bless me, keep me out of hell, all that kind of stuff. And you haven't fully understood the gospel yet. Bernard of Clairvaux says at some point in life, the highest really that we get to in this, in this life is we get to this point where we can say, I love God for God. I love God for God. He is the highest value, the highest worth of my life. Whether I get anything out of it or not. This is how I love my mom today as an adult. I love my mom for who she is, not just for what she does for me. I love God for God. You see expression after expression of this in the Bible, by the way. All the stories of the Old Testament. You know the book of Daniel? Some of you remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You remember that story, some of you? 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're about to be thrown into a fiery furnace and be burned alive because they won't bow down and worship this gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Remember what they say to him? They, they say, King Nebuchadnezzar, we want you to know that God is able to save us even if you throw us in the fiery furnace. But then what do they say? But even if he doesn't, we want you to know, O oh king, we will not bow down and we will not worship your golden statue. That's all love God for God. Uh, Job, arguably the oldest book in the entire Bible. Job was a righteous man. And he loses everything. By the first two chapters of Job, his health is gone. His, his children are taken from him. His, his entire wealth, all his livelihood, it all is stripped away from him. It all comes crashing to the ground. And Job 2, there's this one of the most beautiful expressions of true worship. It says, Job fell down on the ground in worship when he'd lost everything. And in that famous line, he says, you give and you take away, yet I will still choose to bless your name. He, that's all love God for God. He's saying, you, you get to choose, God. You, you bring blessings into my life or you take them away. It doesn't matter. I'll still love you for you. I'm still going to choose to bless you whether you do it or don't do it for me. I'll love God for God. We can only worship like that when we've understood the gospel. We understand that Jesus is the only treasure that when we value him, he actually dies in order to purchase us. And that there's nothing to lose, nothing to gain, nothing to prove. He, he, when we have him, we have everything. And it doesn't matter what else happens. I'll just tell you, I've only experienced that kind of worship, a f I think, a few times in my life. But what one time I can tell you, I feel like I experienced all love God for God worship uh, was in 2010. I was in Haiti. And I was there uh, with a group of pastors, and um, we, we were there with a missions partner here uh, of ours at Frontline. I don't know if you remember what happened in January of 2010, if you can remember the news back then. In January of 2010, early on, there was a 7.0 magnitude earthquake that hit uh, right outside the city of Port-au-Prince and just devastated the area. Thousands and thousands of people lost their lives. So I was in Haiti just a few months after that had happened, uh, and what we were doing there, one of the days, I, I remember we were there, like multiple days we were there actually, what we would do is we would drive this food truck as part of the mission, part of what we were doing, we would drive this, it had like these food rations in this truck, bags of rice and beans. We would drive it down to a tent city and, and hand out these bags of rice and beans to people in this tent city. Now a tent city is exactly what it sounds like. It's literally a, a huge number of people all living in these makeshift tents in the mud, in squalor. There's no sewage, there's no plumbing, there's no running water, there's no electricity. They are living, literally living in the mud in these tents. And just to be clear, these tents did not exist before the earthquake. In other words, these people all had homes. They all had a community. In fact, they were all, all of them were part of a church together. That's how we, are the mission we were part of, that's how they were partnered with this group of people is we knew the church and these people had all been part of this community kind of gathered around this church together. And now they've lost everything and they're, in, they're literally in the tents in mud. So, so I remember we drive down that first day and uh, we drive down to the truck and we get out and like this line of people forms. Uh, so they, as they're coming through, we're gonna hand them these bags of rice and beans. And... I, I will forever in my life remember this group of people is the, the closest I've ever come with my own eyes to see that level of human suffering. It's the worst human suffering I've ever, I've ever seen with my own eyes. I remember, uh, I remember there were like kids that would have these like twisted limbs because what had happened is in the earthquake, like a kid had broken his arm or whatever, but there was no doctor, nobody there to medically set the bone right. And so the bone had just grown like that. There were uh, people missing limbs. There was uh, mo mothers coming through. Their husband had been killed in the earthquake and they had all these kids that they couldn't take care of anymore. It's the most sagging shoulder, dejected group of people I've ever seen. And what I remember is that they're coming through the line and we're handing out these bags of rice and beans and they started singing this song. Uh, like one of them started it and then they started joining in and before long, I mean, like thunderously loud at the top of their lungs, you could hear it throughout the whole tent city. They're all singing this song with one voice, but I couldn't understand what they were singing. I don't speak Creole. They were singing in Creole. 
And then, you know, as I'm standing there, it suddenly dawns on me, oh, I know this tune. You know how your brain does that? We were like, I, I, know, I know this tune. I know, it's sudden, after a minute, it took me a minute, but finally I realized what they're singing is the old hymn, How Great Thou Art. You know, parents who have lost children, children who have lost parents and are now orphans, moving through this line to get just enough for that day, all with one voice they're singing, you know the words, when Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy will fill my heart. Then I will bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. That is all love God for God. I can't sing that song to this day uh, without thinking about that line of people and without it challenging me. Where, where is God in, in my life? Let, let me tell you something. If you have Jesus like that, you're going to be fine. You can go through anything and you'll be fine. If you have Jesus like that, a 7.0 magnitude earthquake cannot shake you. If you have Jesus like that, nothing can tempt you any longer. Nothing can steal your peace or your joy any longer. When you have Jesus like that, you have everything and you're lacking nothing. And that's the value and the power of worship. So a couple thoughts here as we close about how, to, how do we practice this? Worship Jesus, first of all, daily in your circumstances. Don't skip over worship and go right to the requests. Worship him. Hold him as the highest value. You, you know, worship will change the atmosphere in your home. Do you know that? It'll change the atmosphere in your mind at, at work. Make a worship playlist. I, I don't know. Figure out however you do that. But make it a priority every single day to just sit in his presence and ascribe ultimate value and worth to him. And then secondly, Worship Jesus weekly with the body of Christ. What we do and what we're going to do here in a moment as we gather together as the body of Christ and we worship, it, it, when we do that regularly, it teaches us how to worship. It, it, we learn how to ascribe ultimate value and worth to him and we learn how to put him in that place in our lives in the midst of whatever circumstances we go through in the week. It matters when we gather. That's why we worked so hard to put worship online over the last couple of years. You know, it's really hard to do that. For those of you watching online, it took a lot of time and money and we're still getting good at it, trying to figure it out how to put worship online because it's that important. But worship him. When you have Jesus, you have everything. You pray with me. Lord, truly, as we, as we, we sit here, God, truly we're in awe of you. We just worship you, God, that you didn't give in to the temptation of the devil in that moment to just seize power, but you, you obeyed the Father in obedience. You left heaven. You went to the cross. You died in order to purchase us. And therefore, Jesus, you are the only treasure that is worthy. You are the only one that is worthy. We ascribe ultimate value, ultimate worth to you. And we know that our, our lives, our eternities, everything, even the world and the things that we deal with today, uh, are all ultimately going to bow their knee one day. Every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and you are truly Lord. And we worship you today. It's in Jesus' name, everyone said. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we respond. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art.
So as a continued response this morning, we're just gonna declare that we are only alive, we only live because of Christ. So let's get ready to sing this out. On a hill in Israel, mercy spoke for me, mercy spoke for me. Oh, mercy spoke for me. It was on Golgotha's tree. His death brought liberty. His death brought liberty. Oh, his death brought liberty. May I never boast in anything except the cross of Jesus Christ.
Let's just thank him this morning, can we? Yeah, thank you guys. Oh, man, praise God. I'm so glad that you were here with us this morning as we wrapped up this series. I'm so glad um, that you've been able to join us online as well this morning. Um, a couple things. If you're here in the room, if you'd like someone to pray with you, uh, we would love to connect with you and pray with you. Here at the back of the room, there's a banner that says, how can we pray for you? Uh, we would love to, for you to connect with us there. And then um, also, if you're watching online, uh, we'd love also to know how we can pray for you. And so uh, go ahead and let us know online how we can do that. If you're new, um, just, just joining with us. We'd love to help you get connected as well and, and help you take your next step, whether you're here or online. Um, because fall is coming, it's going to be a great time to connect and get involved. And with that being said, um, I'd love to close this sermon and this whole series with a benediction. The word just means a blessing. So if you feel comfortable, would you extend your hands in a posture of reception? You can do this at, uh, if you're watching online as well. And I'd love to just speak these words over us as we go today. And now, my brothers and sisters of Frontline Church, may you love God for God. May he be become the highest value and the highest worth of your entire life. And as you do that, may you find that you have everything that you need, that nothing can shake you, that nothing can turn you. And may it become the highest value of your life, both now and as you move into all of eternity, that worship would be the center focus of your life. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen.